And so out of that study became a very clear need to focus on competitiveness. And we were seeing that express itself through the transatlantic trade and investment partnership. We were seeing that uh, conversation uh, come through and our European colleagues recommending that we open an energy chapter in those trade negotiations. And then the crisis in Ukraine hit the annexation of Crimea, and that conversation on energy security became more intense. It became a national security imperative and led, of course, uh, to a very forward-leaning uh, statement at the G7 summit uh, and subsequent meetings on how to work together as the Group of Seven, as a transatlantic community on energy security. So timely, important, and we have absolutely the right person to help us think about uh, these issues. And we're delighted to welcome Dominique Ristori, who is Director General for Energy of the European Commission. Um, Director General Ristori has had a distinguished career uh, Prior to this uh, position, he was the Director General of the Joint Research Center and has had a, a long and distinguished career in DG Energy, Energy and Transport before it uh, became DG Energy, and has followed European energy policy for over two decades. So literally, uh, this is one of the most experienced uh, European colleagues we have on this subject. So we're going to invite Director General Vistori to help us give some shaping thoughts about uh, this dynamic. And then Sarah is going to moderate a very lively discussion. And knowing many of the colleagues in the room, Sarah, you're going to get some tough questions out there. So <laughs> with that, we welcome you. Uh, we thank Director General Vistori and Sarah. Thank you for a great conversation. And welcome again. Thank you. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very pleased to be there with you in the Center for Strategic and International Studies at the time, energy panorama is changing rapidly. And this is true at all levels. This is true when we are speaking about energy supply, and you refer rightly to the fantastic boom coming from Shell Gas. I had, as you know, the opportunity to visit yesterday uh, Pennsylvania and many sites. Uh, and I was very pleased to see on site how rapid is this development and profitable, not only for the region, but for the global competitiveness of the uh, US economy. And this will affect, at a time, not only uh, US, but also global energy market. At the same time, as you know, it is also important to take into account the rapid development of demand for energy. Energy demand will increase and will increase a lot in the following years, due in particular to the need and the demand coming from emerging economies, China, India, and uh, uh, due to the, the effect of not only demography, but also urbanization. We are shifting from rural area to urban area. And uh, in uh, two decades, 70% of the global population will be located in uh, urban area. This will be at the origin of uh, some difficulties, as it is the case already today in China, with deterioration of air quality in the main cities. But uh, in addition, we will have also to take into account the uh, rapid development of middle class, the new middle class in China, in India, with a fantastic appetite for energy. So if, if you add demography plus urbanization plus uh, rapid development of middle class, the result is a fantastic uh, demand for energy. And this has to be seen in the context of uh, uh, an international competition in order to access to energy resources. In that context, uh, I see, frankly, the transatlantic dialogue between US and EU as particularly crucial. And uh, this is the case because, you know, if you add the US and the EU GDP, 
we are representing together more than 45% of the world GDP. If you are incorporating, at the time you are also speaking about TTIP, world trade, EU and US, we are representing more than one third of the trade at international level. Accordingly, all these aspects are absolutely fundamental. Second, US and the EU, we have uh, in common many things, and I see a lot of convergence regarding our uh, key energy policy priorities. You, in, uh, in US, you are developing a new approach for shifting to a more low-carbon economy. And uh, Shell Gal again, Shell Gas again will help you in order to reduce dramatically uh, CO2 emissions. And at the same time, we Europeans, we are preparing the 2030 energy and climate framework with the same priorities in order to reduce 40% of greenhouse gas emissions by 2030. But also, on both sides of the Atlantic, we are now paying a lot of attention to the level of competitiveness. Accordingly, our intention is not only to develop a, a, a low-carbon economy, an European low-carbon economy, but a competitive European low-carbon economy. And for that, it is important also to learn lessons from experience. This has been the case since the beginning of the year regarding our experience on renewables. Positive for certain aspects, development of technologies and so on, but less negative in other aspects, in particular, the need to shift from subsidies to market-based approach. And we have reached a, already a consensus at the level of our leader in March in order to go in that direction and to eliminate, as a consequence, all unjustified subsidies at the origin of distortion of competition and uncontrolled cost. And this will be fundamental in order to attract private investment absolutely needed for this sector. And we should also uh, based our approach on energy efficiency, on a new capacity uh, not to go into the direction of over-regulation, but to well identify key sectors and to facilitate access to credit and to finance. In particular, I have in mind the housing sector and the fantastic challenge representing by insulation of existing building. And I have, of course, in mind the need to uh, boost local economy going in that direction, and uh, this will be at the origin also of the creation of a lot of new jobs. And this is valid from the extreme north to the extreme south mm. of Europe, from the west to the east. In addition, uh, we see now the need to combine our approach and uh, to go into the direction of uh, a more coordinated policy and presence at a time energy security is at the top of political priorities and concern. And as you know, this is mainly due in Europe to Russia-Ukraine crisis. Our approach is to distinguish energy and gas discussion to political consideration. But for some partners, this is not so simple, mm. to be clear. Accordingly, we are now assisting discussion between Russia and Ukraine. These are the trilateral discussion in order to finish with uh, I can say, good result. 
the first challenge has been to convince Russia to discuss prices. And, and prices based on market mechanism. After weeks and weeks, this has been accepted. And now the point is to finalize discussion on level of prices. But probably we should also discuss other things, including long-term contract. I mean quantities as well as prices in order to reduce the permanent uh, dependence of uh, Ukraine vis-à-vis -vis Russia. We had already the opportunity to cooperate, I can say, on a permanent basis with all uh, US department regarding this crisis. With White House, with DOE, with uh, State Department, etc. And this has been extremely successful. For example, uh, we have been in a situation to agree uh, with, uh, between Slovakia and Ukraine an important uh, new approach regarding uh, new gas pipe and reverse flow. And this into the direction of the main uh, gas uh, site and storage in Ukraine. And this will be operational before next winter. This is important. At the same time, regarding energy security, we have already obtained, based on our proposal, the presentation of a real strategy on energy security, the endorsement of immediate measures to be launched regarding the preparation of next energy winter. And we will pay attention to all aspects, storage, reverse flow, urgent new infrastructure, in particular in Baltic area and with Eastern countries, uh, new possibilities coming from LNG, etc. This will be important. And again, in conformity with uh, the successful G7 summit, we will maintain a bridge with our partner and in particular US. This will be fundamental. For the medium term, largely beyond moderation of demand, we will have to go in two directions. First of all, uh, an increasing level of development for internal resources, indigenous resources, including, when this is possible, nuclear and shale gas. We will launch a new scientific platform regarding shale gas next week in order to facilitate a link with what you are doing in the US, but also in order to manage that less on emotion or ideology and more based on evidence. And I was very pleased to, uh, to examine the situation you have uh, developed in your country based on an active cooperation between all key actors at all levels, not only national level, but at state level, with a clear involvement of uh, uh, all actors, NGO, uh, commissioner district. Uh, this is fundamental in order to finish well, because all these things should be seen as profitable for all for domestic citizens, as well as for the global level of competitiveness of the economy. And of course, we will have also to go into the direction of diversification of supply. And we have proposed new pistes, not only a new uh, capacity to exploit fully LNG, but also uh, to accelerate some project in the south of Europe, because there is many capacities not used in terms of reserve and pipes, but also regarding the uh, so-called Southern Corridor. And the so-called Southern Corridor is affecting some countries, I can say, uh, not easy, which I can say, but when we are speaking about uh, uh, Central Asia area, Caucasian area, when we are speaking about uh, 
uh, all those in direct contact with uh, Iraq, Syria, have not to be long regarding the dimension of the challenge. And without an increasing level of cooperation between United States and the European Union, it will not be possible to deliver and to deliver in time in terms of acceleration, including with a new increasing role of Turkey as a key transit country. This will be absolutely fundamental. Uh, for all of these things, uh, US and the EU should act based on uh, not only common values, this is, is evident, but also based on more convergences. And this is valid also at the time we are speaking about the TTIP. The TTIP should not only be based on implementation of horizontal trade rules for the energy sector, but based also on the new capacity to better and fully exploit what we are doing in the context of our day-to-day -day cooperation. For example, with DOE, we are developing a lot of projects, concrete projects, on uh, smart grid, on electromobility, on nuclear, on hydrogen, on many things. And uh, we should uh, consider a new capacity to translate this cooperation into a common standard. Standard uh, implemented in the context of uh, the whole chain of energy. I mean, uh, dedicated to generation, dedicated to transmission and distribution, to storage, to energy demand. And if we will be successful, maintaining a, a clear bridge with business and companies, we will finish well and we finish successfully. This is a big challenge, of course, but uh, I am confident what we are doing together regarding definition of energy priorities, regarding uh, development of uh, in common of new technologies, and technologies will be key. Uh, acting at external level in the context of uh, present crisis, but also largely beyond, this will open new routes to combine our two main goals, I mean, competitive low carbon economy, as well as an increased level of energy security. And this will be profitable for our society, but profitable also for the world. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay. Um, Dominic Mastroy, thank you very much for those comments. I think they touched on probably everything that people are wondering about uh, in the room. And so we'll have plenty of time for, for questions and discussion. I, I thought I might start by just uh, kind of pulling out two themes that, that, um, that you identified in your remarks. It, you know, in this town, we have a phrase. We don't use it all the time in, in implementation, but it's you know, never let a good crisis go to waste. Uh, and and these days, I've been thinking about that in sort of a European, EU, US, transatlantic dialogue context, right? It, um, both for a lot of the things that Heather had brought up um, and some of the work that we've been doing on the geopolitics of, uh, of the impact of unconventionals, it, it does definitely see, seem to me that, um, that Europe in particular has been going through sort of phases in its evolution in its energy policy, as do all countries, but very explicitly, um, trying to be ambitious in terms of environmental, the environmental agenda, indeed trying to be a leader uh, in terms of, uh, of decarbonization goals. Um, but, but then, you know, in the wake of uh, what is a global financial crisis, being very concerned about competitiveness. Uh, and, and then now, in a very rapid sort of succession, having the energy security agenda thrust uh, right back in a very prominent way um, uh, within, uh, to, within its uh, sort of limelight and agenda setting. I wonder in the context of a, of a crisis or in the context of a situation that sort of causes you to look very, very deeply at your priorities, have there been shifts in the balance of those things? And do you, in the work that you do, find them to be mutually reinforcing shifts 
right? So, so things that, um, that support the agenda and the strategy that the EU has put forth and, and uh, give you opportunity to do new things, or do they challenge it? Uh, and, and I'll follow up with another question, but maybe start with that. <coughs> Obviously, energy security is opening uh, a new momentum to develop things differently and based on more, uh, uh, a more important capacity to deliver, uh, to deliver rapidly. And first of all, there is now a new common understanding in Europe regarding the need to join efforts, largely beyond some differences we have between our member states in order to act uh, differently. Mm -hmm. This is particularly important at the time we have to manage also uh, common external project. Mm -hmm. First point. Second point, uh, we see the need to maintain uh, a full uh, compatibility and a real bridge between low carbon economy and uh, energy security. Because at the time we are speaking about progressive decarbonization of economy, uh, we are encouraging uh, uh, development of, uh, in particular, indigenous resources. Shell gas in the US are contributing a lot for reducing CO2 emission. Mm -hmm. But in Europe, the combination of nuclear and renewable energy is also extremely important. Because today, today, not in 2020 or 2030, 50% of European electricity generation is CO2 free today. Uh, renewables representing 23% of electricity generation and nuclear 28. Accordingly, we, we see the need to uh, maintain a clear link and not to oppose sustainability, competitiveness and security. And we have a chance if we will manage well not only to well combine the three, but to finish with uh, uh, important results regarding the three priorities. Mm -hmm. The three priorities. And in my opinion, it would be an error to oppose, for example, competitiveness and sustainability. At the time, it is crystal clear we can open new route uh, regard, uh, for, uh, for energy policy. Uh, with a, a new capacity to finish with more jobs and uh, more economic activities at all levels. And uh, it's important in that context not to forget the fact that energy is affecting the whole population. 100% day and night, day and night. Uh, but energy is also affecting the whole economy and not only the so-called intensive industries. Mm -hmm. Accordingly, uh, developing this, uh, this approach will uh, open also new opportunities. For example, look about the technologies. We are speaking about the ongoing cooperation between US and the EU concerning smart grid. But we should go beyond and finishing with smart home introducing new technologies directly uh, in individual house, affecting directly the final client. This is a sort of new quasi revolution based on the same model we had for developing uh, iPhone, uh, iPad, and so on. Mm -hmm. But giving to the final consumer, energy consumer, the full command, the full command of its energy consumption. This will be a fantastic challenge for industry in order to produce industrial devices. Industrial devices. Mm -hmm. And it would be good to facilitate the things in order to have all this production based uh, in our countries, mm -hmm. in the US or in the EU. And, uh, and also uh, to open a new uh, facility to balance energy bill competitiveness and uh, with a rapid elimination of uh, energy waste. This will be absolutely fundamental. Mm -hmm. And this, I can say, is not for 20 years. I'm not speaking for 
20, uh, 25 or 20, 30, technologies are mature to prepare the ground for the massive distribution of smart homes in order to prolong the efforts already in progress concerning smart meters and uh, smart grid. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You, you answered my follow-up question, which was whether or not sort of the balance or the, the sort of current geopolitical situation and the oppor opportunity, you know, uh, difficulties it presents was bringing more cohesion among the member states that you, yeah. member countries that yeah. you are working with. Uh, or if it has sort of exacerbated some of the differences. Uh, uh, maybe you could follow up on that. But, but additionally, I wanted to point out one of the things I found sort of striking in your remarks is you have an optimism that is related to and along the lines of the time scale that it takes to develop energy projects and new energy technologies. And there's a lot of people within the energy space that we work with that are very optimistic about a series of future energy revolutions and energy changes that are underway and very optimistic about them as you've just spoke. It is hard though to bring those sort of optimistic forward looking science and technology indeed sort of developments and apply them to a situation that is, is somewhat acute, right? And so uh, one of the things that I was curious about in, in sort of the, the sort of G7 response and, and future responses to, to sort of the current, um, the current situation as you're thinking about EU energy strategy is how to take some of those longer range, you know, which in the energy world isn't that long range, 2030 is not that far away, and, and, and allow them to have sort of the political and, and geopolitical impact that you seek to have them have today. It is a conversation we're having a lot here in Washington. You can say, first of all, for your first remark, uh, in, the, in this crisis context, we see a rapid evolution of attitude uh, of many of our member states. And for example, some Lead European leaders, about 18, received two letters from President Putin. And it has been possible to manage twice a unique response signed by the President of the European Commission with the full support of all member states. This has been a first signal sent also to some in the world regarding a new capacity in Europe to manage the things, having in mind the general interest we have in common, in common. And, 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 and this will, will remain also uh, one of the consequences of a specific situation we have now. At global level, the main discussion in the last G7 summit have been around energy issues. And it has been possible to manage the things well prepared in Rome at the G7 ministerial in order not to finish with a, a sort of a usual concept, but with a, a real strategy mm. and a, a real political will to go in that direction. At the same time, we prepare in a few weeks a new European energy security strategy based on uh, clear priorities and with a clear distinction between immediate actions and medium and long term. Because as you know, and as you said, with energy policy, we have to combine the two. When you are investing, we are not investing for two or three years, we are investing for decades. Mm -hmm. But uh, this new capacity to use the momentum positively will open a new chance to deliver. Mm -hmm. yeah. Great. We'll uh, start to take some questions from the audience. We just have a couple of ground <coughs> rules. Uh, please wait for the mic. Please identify yourself and your affiliation. And if you can please make sure it's a question, uh, that would be very helpful. So I think we've got one in the back there. <coughs> Hi, uh, thanks for the speech, student from Science Johns Hopkins. Um, not only like a um, sort of interdimensional cooperation between Europe and the United States, what I can also think about listening to your speech is about outer factors such as China. So either Europe could be good customer or at the same time could be competitor. 
And do you see the possibility that the United States could be sort of stimulant, I mean, China could be stimulant um, in terms of like a transatlantic cooperation, or do you see that Europe could be independent um, in front of like a China factors in terms of like, um, you know, buying energy or competing? Thank you. Uh, China is one of the most important actors at the time we are speaking about the world energy panorama. And uh, China is fighting in order to access to energy resources everywhere. We received recently in Brussels the Chinese president. We have a summit. And uh, it is crystal clear, China is present in the context of a dialogue with the US, uh, with EU, but also with Russia. The Chinese president signed with President Putin an important agreement a uh, few weeks after the summit with EU. China is also present in uh, Central Asia. China is also present in uh, Africa. And in that context, uh, uh, the energy demand coming from China will remain one of the most important, if not the first. As I mentioned before, this will continue during a long period because of the acceleration of the move from rural area to urban area and uh, uh, the multiplication of uh, middle class in China. Mm. But at the same time, China is confronted with uh, difficult challenges, not only in terms of security of supply, but also in terms of uh, rapid deterioration of uh, air quality, in particular in the centrum of mm. the main Chinese cities. And accordingly, they have the need to cooperate with US, with EU, in order to find the adequate response for that. One is the shift from uh, coal to uh, other energy sources and the abandon of any use, domestic use of coal in urban area. Another one is the development of clean uh, transport Accordingly, the development also of electromobility. This has to be seen in the global context of smart cities. This will be important at the time we will discuss the preparation of the next international climate conference. As you know, the former mayor of New York, Michael Bloomberg, has been designated special envoy of the Secretary General of the United Nations, in charge in particular of, of compact mayors. All these aspects will become extremely important and accordingly, any effort in order to uh, uh, associate China, in order to become more active regarding development of transparent and competitive energy market, as well as the capacity to increase the sensibilization of China vis-à-vis -vis climate change and the need to act, to act, will be profitable for all. Mm -hmm. And uh, I see the need to address this issue and to discuss also perhaps more between the US and the EU how to facilitate uh, this common approach in order uh, to help also China to, to make the uh, bad choice and to find the adequate solution regarding uh, the, their specific challenges. Mm -hmm. We've been paying a lot of attention as well to, uh, as you mentioned, to sort of the, uh, the potential for, again, taking another 
sort of crisis and not letting it go to waste, the potential for sort of the, the local pollution concerns in China to drive uh, either a shift to, you know, coal to natural gas switching or, or greater efficiency measures or what, or examine the options they realistically have on the table. I, I do also wonder, though, it, thinking that we also have the strategic and economic uh, dialogue coming up here in the United States with China. Uh, another driver that we've been very interested in is is looking at um, some of the economic reforms that China will have to undertake in the in the coming years. And one of their key inputs in that reform process is what what are energy prices and how are energy prices rationalized within their system? What is the role of state-owned enterprises uh, in in sort of their domestic energy economy? Are all those things things that you're discussing with the Chinese as well uh, within the context of the efforts you were just talking about? Absolutely, we are persistently insisting on the crucial importance of developing uh, open and transparent market oriented to uh, competitiveness, but based on, on market mechanisms. Yeah, yeah. And this is absolutely crucial. Yeah. And this will help to attract also uh, investment and, in, and, 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 to, and to facilitate a real uh, new uh, management of uh, low carbon economy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Accordingly, uh, the contribution and the participation of China in the preparation of the next international climate conference uh, will be absolutely key. Mm -hmm. And for preparing that adequately, uh, discussion you will have in US uh, with China, as well as the discussion we have with them, uh, will be of uh, crucial importance. Yeah. And what we are doing together will help also in that direction. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I refer to electromobility, I refer to clean transport, but many other things will, uh, will be uh, important to yeah. examine. Yeah, there will be a lot of change. Yes, please. Hello, Brett Fortnum from Inside US Trade. Um, the EU has previously expressed interest in uh, getting into the U.S. energy market, whether it's through uh, a, the lifting of the crude oil export ban or uh, with further uh, li liquefied natural gas exports. Um, and right now, the U.S. is negotiating um, two large trade deals, one uh, TTIP, which you mentioned, with the European Union, and also the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And if, those, if both of those deals were to go through, um, I've heard that some of those Asian markets might be more attractive for U.S. energy exports. So what is the EU's goal in terms of being able to uh, gain access to um, those U.S. markets if they're um, also trying to compete with those Asian companies, or excuse me, countries? Uh, I, I see uh, a real common interest from US and EU to organize the things in order to finish successfully the TTIP negotiation, including for key aspects regarding energy. And when you are considering the existing level of trade between US and the EU in all sense, you are convinced immediately regarding the uh, win-win approach we have to develop in common. Accordingly, the transatlantic negotiation will be of crucial importance in order to pave the way for the further development of not only our bilateral cooperation, this will be important, but also to become a sort of model for the rest of the world. Accordingly, I will not oppose our relation with your relation with Asia. Because at the end of the day, and in order to prolong what we were discussing, what just before, if we will wish to invite our partner, and in particular in Asia, to go into the same direction we are promoting. I mean open, competitive, efficient, performant market. There is a need to agree in common some standards in particular that could be applicable in other areas in the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. And this will be uh, 
an important contribution to the development of work trade at the end of the day. And not uh, taking out your crystal ball for a moment, how, how, how important is having an explicit energy chapter within a trade agreement as part of that articulation? I mean, is it, is, it, is it doable if you don't have that particular part of the agreement manifest itself? Can it be integrated in a different yeah. way? I think in the following uh, weeks and months, we should develop efforts on both sides of the Atlantic in order to go in that direction, mm. in the direction of the preparation of uh, an energy uh, charter in the context of TTIP, mm -hmm. but with the real capacity uh, uh, to organize the discussion uh, based on uh, capacity to deliver. And for that, an adequate preparation with all uh, key companies will be also extremely relevant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you think that, that given the U.S. focus on trying to be helpful in, in, in sort of creating a more energy secure uh, uh, Europe uh, or trying to sort of help in, in that regard, um, that the U.S. might become more supportive of this idea of, of integrating energy into trade agreements in a way that tries to serve as an example for others, sort of an extension of your yeah. own external yeah. policy yeah. goals. Yeah. Absolutely. We should uh, manage that based on a coherent and global approach. Mm -hmm. Accordingly, the trade component should be seen part of a global approach, a coherent approach. When we are speaking about a strategy, it is crystal clear the strategy has to incorporate all key sectors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And trade sector uh, will be important uh, in, in that regard. Mm -hmm. we, we've not talked uh, very much or explicitly about a very sensitive issue of energy-related sanctions, which is obviously something else that we're spending a lot of time focusing on uh, yeah. here, uh, both in the context of uh, uh, how it can and or should be applied to current situations, whether it be sort of the the ongoing negotiations with Iran or the escalating or de-escalating, depending on what the news says, any point in time, uh, situation between Russia and, and, and Ukraine. Um, but there's a broader academic debate here about what the appropriate role of energy is within that context. Is that something you're spending a lot of time thinking about as well? Yes, but uh, at the same time, we have the same uh, challenges in Europe. We will have a new commission, a new parliament, it will be important to well explain this issue, to establish the adequate link with the counterpart in the Congress, etc., mm -hmm. in order to prepare and to establish good conditions for the negotiation. But my opinion is the existing context, including in terms of energy security, could facilitate the move into this direction. Yes, sir. Uh, Brian Beery, Washington correspondent, Europolitics. What's your view on the development, uh, the desirability of Europe to develop its own shale gas um, uh, potentials and what the European Union's role should be in that process? Two points. First of all, in our communication at the end of January regarding 2030 energy and climate, we have presented also a recommendation and a communication on shale gas. And we decided after a long, long internal discussion not to add any new legislation for shale gas. Second, in the new context of energy security, it has been possible to recommend in our strategy presented and discussed last week, at the end of last week, by our leader, to, uh, pro to present and to promote uh, the need to develop more indigenous resources, including shale gas. Accordingly, we will launch, in addition, next week, a scientific 
shell gas platform mm -hmm. in order to assist member states and all those we will go in that direction. This is important because you see uh, we should overcome some uh, controversial discussion we had in the past based more on emotion and on ideology sometimes and we should present the things based on uh, real development. And the US experience in that context is extremely relevant. Relevant for two reasons. The first, the adequate implementation of technique and technologies adapted to each location and the use of well-known uh, technique. Mm -hmm. And second, I can say an adequate governance between all those concerned, not only companies, not only national level, the EPA, uh, USGS, but also state level, district level, uh, as well as, uh, at the end of the day, with uh, final uh, consumers. Mm. And uh, this has been extremely profitable for all, for individuals, for regions of state, mm -hmm. and at national level. Accordingly, it's important to base the analysis on scientific development, fact and figures. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, we would like to maintain and to establish a link between this European shale gas platform and the uh, US. Mm -hmm. That's great. They, one of the questions we, when we were sort of talking this, about this beforehand a little bit was, you know, we have, since the onset of sort of the US experience with shale gas and tide oil production, we have had lots of folks come, come to us and say, and, and I know everyone in the room that participates in this field feels the same, uh, how, how do we replicate the U.S. experience? To which we respond, "Do you really want to?" Uh, we've been uh, we've we've had a remarkable boom, as as one would say, that's still booming, but it's come with a lot of issues to manage, obviously. And so, I very much uh, I think that you're you're bringing up a fact-based, consultative uh, a discussion is very important and one that our experience would would certainly support. There's an additional question also, though, uh, which has been one that we've grappled with here, which is sort of the commerciality of yeah, different of resources, of which I think folks are surprised and often forget or leave off their list uh, the things that that enabled the experience we've had here, which, you know, as, as we were talking about before, is, is the... Uh, land ownership and, and resource rights for individuals, which is a pretty strong incentive for production, and then also the high high price um, prices uh, that existed here in the United States enabled to enable that to get off the ground. Do you think, along with this sort of fact-based, more um, um, consultative discussion about sort of the risks and the management and the approach of development of shale gas, there is also a, a discussion going on about sort of the economic contours of what is required to be able to, to get people yeah. to invest uh, in, in that resource development. Yes, I think so, because you see, uh, first of all, it will be important at the start uh, to identify the reserve, the dimension of reserve, the location of reserve. We will have to take into account some uh, differences also with US terms of density of population and so on. We will associate also the counterpart of uh, USGS, Don Piero Geosurvey. Uh, then it will be important to assess the economic viability of project. Mm -hmm. But I am convinced some member states and some actors will go in that direction. Mm -hmm. And we see now a new evolution of things. Accordingly, uh, this is promising. We should learn some lessons from the US. We should adapt that to our specificities and characteristics, including regarding public acceptance and the importance in Europe of precautionary principle. Mm -hmm. 
but uh, this is opening a new opportunity and uh, we have launched the ball and uh, we would like now to test the things. Well, recognizing that uh, that you are in Washington uh, and you've you've come here perhaps for a reason, I think the the last question I would I would ask before we let you go is, um, what can what can the U.S. do to support this partnership that you've envisioned? And and given you know as Heather had said, sort of a, a, the prospect for a, a new uh, new leadership team in in Europe as well. Um, what, what, from your vast experience and your dedication to the energy sector, uh, are the key things that we need to be able to accomplish, and how does the U.S. live up to its end of that bargain? I can say, uh, first of all, we have now a governance, a transatlantic governance for energy well in place. In particular, with a transatlantic energy council chaired by the Secretary, your Secretary of State, but also with uh, uh, the U.S. Secretary for Energy, Commissioner, etc., and High Representative. Uh, it has been possible already to well address some key issues, including technologies. And at the same time, we have now uh, developed many convergences regarding both competitiveness, climate issues, sustainability, and in particular, energy security. We have a common will to address the challenge in terms of operational actions. Of course, we will be successful only if we will also associate all of the key players, operators, regulators, TSO, etc. And if we will go in that direction, I am convinced this will be profitable for all, at all levels, for our economies in US as well as in Europe, but also profitable for our societies, and this is fundamental. Thank you very much. Great, excellent. Thank you very much. Please join me Thank in you. thanking Dominic. Thank